I'm going to let you supply your own uh, fantasy or idea of what Robert Mitchum is or has been to you through his movie career and maybe is tonight. And here he is in the flesh, as they say, with us here at Montage. I just was talking to a guy on another subject, and he was talking about a private detective who spends a lot of time looking like, as the guy put it, Robert Mitchum. Is, uh, must, do you hear that often? He must be out of work a lot. <laughs> well, he doesn't make many movies, maybe. <laughs> no. No, does that bug you that that goes on? And it does all the time. No, not really. I remember when I first went to work, and uh, I'd walk into a casting office, and I'd say, what is it? You know, I, uh, I mean, they had sort of that uh, sleek, waitressy type that was the leading man, you know. And right. They, and they didn't think that I was old enough to be a character actor, and I wasn't pretty enough to be a leading man. And they used to say, uh, have you ever thought about having your nose fixed? And I said, a lot of other people have changed it around for me. Is that your real name, Mitchum? And I, if I were it not, I'd have changed it to Gable, wouldn't I? Yeah, yeah so. something more saleable. Then later, I would hear people say, talk about the Mitchum type, and I still don't know what it is. And Hopefully it varies. Well, let's, I think it's probably the rugged, tough guy, uh, don't take any baloney from people thing. Uh, you well, know. I think that developed largely because, uh, like I said, you, you know, obviously I'd been run over several times. Yeah. And uh, I worked cheap. I used to do all my own stunts. I didn't know, as a matter of fact. Seriously? No, you're Truly, sure. I, yeah. I didn't know that there was such a thing as a stunt man until I found myself at the bottom of the pile one time. And some, <laughs> one of the fellows who was biting my ear off said, look, we get paid for this. You know? And I was doing them out of a job. And I thought, well, uh, discretion being the better part, why well, I let them do all the heavy work because they get $150 a stunt, and I was making that per week. Where were you born and raised? I read your biography, but I'd rather hear you. Well, I was born in Bridgeport, Connecticut, and I uh, stayed there till the ripe old age of 18 months, and then I just, you know, we just stayed ahead of the rent until I went out to California. And I had uh, just come off the chain gang in Savannah and uh, went up to Delaware to try to heal up, and I went through the coldest winter at that time in the history of the weather bureau. The outhouse door froze, and I thought it was time to leave, get out of here. So I came out and caught a freight train and went what to California. What do you mean chain gang in Savannah? I mean uh, the Chatham County Brown Farm number one. Really? Yeah. What were you there for? Well, not uh, for any longer than I could <laughs> arrange. I don't know. It's just dangerous and suspicious character with no visible means of support. A common charge of vagrancy, you know. They oh, I see. Yeah. Pluck you off and put you to work on the gang. What, as a kid you'd started to bum around the yeah. country? And mm. It's like the movie Cape Fear. That's Max Cady, I think, was the character. You know, we, sh we shot that in Savannah. Yeah, I know. And I got back to Savannah and, Savannah, and these women would come up and say, how do you like Savannah the second time around? <laughs> they remembered you being there. Oh, well, they, the moment I arrived, they said, yeah. that, you know, Joe, the wounded tennis player, returns. And they had a shot of me, age 15, you know, looking gaunt and disheveled with a number across my chest. So. Heavens. Well, when did you decide at what point to get in the movie business and make movies? I just went up and started knocking on the door and asking if they were taking on any hands in the accident department. And the next thing I knew, I was on a bad horse up in Kernville, California, in a hop along Cassidy. They said, can you ride? I said, oh, yeah. They said, no, really, we're afraid of these New York actors, because right. anybody they didn't know is a New York actor, and right. those cowboys, uh, you know, are very suspicious of them. I said, oh, sure. So I used to break hand horses on my daddy's ranch down in, uh, in South Texas. Oh, all of a sudden, anyone who ever broke horses on our ranch can ride well enough for pictures. And I got on up in Kernville, and the horse threw me 40 feet and came right after me. <laughs> now, you have a ranch, I read, somewhere. Is oh, that true? It's, uh, horses? And well, a lot of horses, yeah. Making money or just for There's fun? No way. No, you can't feed horses and make money. Yeah. You have how many yeah. children? Well, Three. All in the business? One in the business, certainly, I know of. Two of them, Jim and Chris. And uh, my daughter is working with a writer now. Who's, she's doing research for a writer who's preparing a film. She had been working in an office before that. Did you want them to get in the business? It was a matter of it was relevant. difference to me, yeah. I mean, if they could uh, sustain themselves in it, fine. Do you think it's been uh, uh, helpful to them that you're their father in the business? I should th rather think not, no. Why? Well, A, uh, we can't work in the same film together. I mean, maybe I could get him a job if we didn't look so much alike. You know? Yeah. People say, you know, Jim came touring down through the South, and I said, he looks exactly like you. And I said, well, he's been drinking, you know. <laughs> Chris actually resembles me a great deal more. But uh, he looks like I looked when I was his age. 
Jim was born fully blown. He looked like I looked when I was 40. You know? Still does. Do you, uh, forgive me for asking, and you know, we'll slip over if you don't, but do you talk about that incident uh, with marijuana and so forth? Back? All the time. Do you? Oh, sure. That seems so incredible Stop now. Stop kiddies on the street and tell them about it. You know, <laughs> wake well, them up. Give us your perception of what happened. Uh, I know exactly what happened. Okay, good. You know, they, I was uh, walked into my house. I was taking some fellow out to dinner, and he insisted on stopping by someplace. I stopped in. Seven minutes later, they broke the door down. I said, I'll go quietly. And they said, Mitchum raised his hand in a threatening <laughs> gesture like this. You know. Yeah. And that was it. And there were a lot of people involved. I knew nothing about this at the time. And uh, they had had a bug in the chimney. The house had been under surveillance for six months. And uh, the house belonged to a, a very powerful executive, motion picture executive. And he had a, uh, I think, a French mistress who dwelt therein. And she had sublet it to someone else, and she used it for her own purposes, mm -hmm. one of which was uh, to uh, lure me into the nest. Mm -hmm. And uh, I stopped en route to a rib joint out in the valley, and as I say, that's it, the door crashed in. And when I found out how many people were involved and how many people could be injured by this, I said, well, look, I'll just take it all myself. And I agreed to do six months. They gave me two years. I it was for what? Possession of marijuana? Conspiring to possess. Conspiring to possess. In other words, yeah. two guys talking about getting a joint. What? Uh, mostly two girls talking about it. Okay. I was sitting there waiting to, and looking at my watch. I, the minute I walked in, I knew the joint was hot. Really? Right now. And I walked over to the phone. She said, what are you doing? And I said, this joint is on fire. And I was going to call somebody. And she said, no, that's nonsense. There's no one here. And I said, who are those two cats peeking in the window? She said, those dogs. She went to bam, and the door flew open. I said, oh. Okay had it, you know. Well, uh, it obviously didn't destroy your career, but I guess at the time you thought it might. No, no not really. I just, uh, you know, it was, uh, I never really considered it a career. It was just, you know, I'd do it day by day. You know. Well, yeah, I guess, there again, I'm speaking because I'm not in it. Uh, and uh, as a matter of fact, at that time, uh, Howard Hughes had assumed control of the studio, and uh, he was, uh, he wanted to go to court and, and expose everyone, you know, really? the whole, yeah. and I said, no. I, and so I said, as long as I, you know, can find gainful employment when I get out, and he just guaranteed that, so I had really no problems. Right. Was it, uh, did you spend six months in jail? No, 60 days. 60 days. Yeah. How was that? Were you, were you known enough as a star then, that, or as I an actor, well-known actor? At I was making $3,000 a week. And I couldn't understand what all the fuss was about. And uh, all these cats in the joint said, are you crazy? You know, they could put in the, uh, in the big headline, says John Schwartz throws up and nobody do anything. They put, says Robert Mitchum, and the whole joint fell apart. Yeah. And they said, do you really believe that, that no one knows who you are? And I didn't. You really thought you were there, just another guy pulling yeah. time? Now, are you really serious you really thought that? Of course, I truly did. See, people find it hard to believe that, that people in your position don't have a very strong awareness of, of your reputation, your image, and your career. You know, what other word to use? I, it's, it's never, I'm not, not involved in that, you know. I, it's really another department. I, don't, I have nothing to do with that. Well, for example, do you worry about how you look? Not at all, no. I mean, do you, do you worry about wrinkles or, or overweight no. or what, whatever, and you, you look no. good shape? How old are you? Sixty. Well, you look in great shape, but you don't worry about that. Is <laughs> well, how? I mean, oh, you know, uh, dieting and going to uh, health spas and uh, can taking you skin, skin tighteners. Can you imagine trying to diet and be out on the road with somebody like Addie Addison, you know, and you go from one bar to another. There's no way. No way. I know. thought Addie quit drinking. He died. It has nothing to do with me. He just <laughs> he insists that I do what I was drinking for He's him. He's a cheering you know. section, anyway. But, uh, you know, it's like being on the luncheon circuit. You've got uh, cream chicken and peas, and uh, no way that you can stay away. Well, I know p you want people to see the picture, but beyond that, what uh, uh, what do you want to say to people watching you right now? I've never seen you on a talk show. You don't do too many. Any message to take to the American people who watched Bob Mitchum? For how many years have they seen you in movies, by the way? I started in June 1942. That's a long time. It's it 36 is, years. Maybe it's enough. 30, no, I think not. As long as, you, as long as you feel like it, keep I like quit every morning, you know. Do you ever think of getting out? All the time. <clears throat> Why? Well, it gets to be a little monotonous, you know. It's rather banal. The whole point is that 
suddenly somebody comes up with a, an offer that is uh, really too attractive to refuse. You know, your wife wants to go to Europe, and uh, miraculously a script arrives, which is not too bad, and uh, takes place in Europe, and uh, it, it involves a lot of other very attractive and very entertaining and interesting people, and uh, it's a perfect solution. I think that's a fair way to sum up, Robert Mitchum. Thanks very much for being with us. Thank you. The Big Sleep, Robert Mitchum. We'll be right back.